I'm Sam Roberts of the New York Times, and welcome to the New York Times Close Up. It was a tumultuous weekend again, marked by bombast, anger, mistrust, revelations. In a moment, New York Times editorial board member Mara Gay brings us the board's assessment and her own. The Times series Unsheltered opened our eyes to the challenges of remaining in our apartments or finding one that's affordable. New York Times researcher and reporter Grace Ashford, a member of the investigative team led by Kim Barker, will explain. My Times colleagues discuss the week's lead stories on the backstory, and I'll add some additional thoughts on CODA. But first, New York Times editorial board member Mara Gay. And Mara, it seems that with the legislative session coming to a close this month of June, uh, the legislature once again is hijacking the city on a whole number of issues, whether it's speed cameras in areas close to the schools, whether it's rent control, whether it's homeless shelters, all sorts of things. How do we, we New Yorkers, let them get away with that? <laughs> It's a great question. One of the ways that we do is by not participating in local elections. Um, and I, you know, the board has called for years, and I'm happy to join them in this effort, has called for uh, election laws to change so that it's easier to vote in New York. It's, New York is one of the hardest states to vote in. And so that's something that, frankly, you'll hear from us on um, a lot this year. One really horrible example um, or good example of this is that uh, the gubernatorial primary election this year uh, is on a Thursday. Uh, first of all, elections are often on Tuesdays, so that kind of throws voters off. And then it, this year it's going to be on a Thursday. It doesn't help anyone vote. People are still going to work, going to school. So I think that's something we really need to push uh, for a change on. But, you know, just generally speaking, Albany legislators have a, those lawmakers have a real incentive to keep control because that's what keeps their donors happy. So that's, that's the reality. But most of the control they seem to exercise is stuff that, that cramps the city, that prevents us from doing things that most people seem to agree on substance makes sense. Sure, but if you look at the rent laws as an example, I mean, uh, lobbyists from the uh, real estate industry have been backing uh, folks, state lawmakers, for years. Um, and, you know, Shelley Silver, uh, Joe Bruno, um, you know, and frankly, Governor Cuomo has kind of overseen this in more recent years, just allowing uh, these guys to run amok and essentially, some, in some cases, just even write the, their own um, interests into the law at the city's expense. And I think when voters aren't paying attention, because it's very hard, you know, you're in New York City, and so most people, for example, until recently, who rode the subways didn't really realize that it was the state that had control of the subways. So you don't think of traffic cameras, schools, rent laws. There's a whole host of issues that I believe the city should have local control on, and it just seems to make sense. And we don't. So uh, we, we should look at that. And that's because, uh, to a large extent, of the state constitution. So we have Governor Cuomo now taking, once again, responsibility for the subways, suggesting that uh, he now thinks the $19 billion financing plan for the MTA makes some sense, perhaps uh, supported by congestion pricing. Does this mean Cynthia Nixon's uh, candidacy is a good thing for the very reason that it's at least pushing the governor in the right direction? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, there's no reason to be coy about this. I think competition is always a good thing. Um, this is an unexpected source of competition for the governor. And, you know, I think if you're Cynthia Nixon, you might start to wonder, well, wait a second, if I'm going to give him all these ideas and he's just going to co-opt them, what am I running on? But, but as far as New Yorkers uh, go, I think this competition has been great. So right what do New Yorkers say? Do they say, isn't it great that he's now supporting this? Or do they say, well, where has he been until now? And how do we know after the uh, gubernatorial primary he's not going to change his mind? I don't think most New Yorkers think about it um, in, in that kind of a granular way. I think, frankly, people just want somebody to take control, take responsibility, lay out a plan, and fix it. I think that's, that's just really, they don't care who does it. When you talk to people, they don't care really where the, um, the, the benefit go or the credit goes. They just want someone to, to take control and ownership 
of it. I mean, they've seen the mayor and the governor, especially, going back and forth and sniping mm. for over a year now, longer than that. And, and I think that really makes them sick to their stomach. And I think Cuomo, he's got a primary. He's, I think, obviously considering um, you know, running for president. And so he actually has some incentive here to um, be able to say that he turned this around. And that's good for everybody. I don't want to bring you back a year from now and hold you to this, but do you think this is realistic? Do you think the governor is actually going to stand by this and over the course of the next year support the $19 billion, get congestion pricing, and move ahead with this plan and actually take responsibility for the subway system, since it is a state responsibility? It's hard. I mean, it really is hard to play it out. I, it's definitely true that in the past, uh, the state has not always come through with the money that it's promised. And so I think part of this is going to be making sure that we're on track right now. So where is the money that's due to the subway right now? And is that fully funded? Um, so people have to stay, people meaning us, on top of him. You wrote an uh, editorial about the homeless shelters and uh, the fact that people on 58th Street don't want it, one in their backyard, just like the people in Maspeth, Queens. We have 60,000 people or so who are homeless or at least don't have a permanent home. Where are we supposed to put them? <laughs> uh, that's right. I, I agree with you. I mean, I think ultimately this is going to have to be a citywide effort. And, and I mean, everybody has to kind of pitch in. And, and what I was hoping to uh, say in that piece was just asking on, um, on New Yorkers as neighbors to just step up and do their part. Uh, nobody really in an ideal world wants to live across the street from a men's shelter. But you know what? Nobody wants to be in a shelter either. And so I think just having a little bit of compassion, but at the same time also asking for reasonable um, accommodations from the city, wanting to know who's going to be in the shelter, wanting to know what the security plan is, that's all fine. Um, there, there are plenty of tough questions to be asked of the mayor. But ultimately, everybody has to be a part of the solution. And, and frankly, and I, you know, frankly, if that's not something you're interested in, then there are cities that don't have homeless problems where you can live in. I mean, part of living in New York City is you can't throw the baby out of the bathwater. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a big city with big challenges, but also big rewards. And so... Speaking you know, of the mayor, of I'm not going to test you on all the hundreds of emails, but what's your <laughs> takeaway of those emails between the mayor and his so-called agents of the city? Uh, my takeaway is that uh, it's funny they say the cover-up is worse than the crime. And in, in this case, I think that's absolutely uh, relevant because there, so far, there, I haven't seen anything in these emails, and there are thousands of them. I haven't read them all, but there are, I've seen nothing in these emails that is... Uh, scandalous or hints at corruption, but the fact that he prevented the release of the emails for, uh, I think, a couple of years mm -hmm. uh, is in itself the story. And that's just concerning. I mean, it says so much about um, his uh, mistrust of the press. And a mayor who uh, ran on a platform and pledged transparency. That's right. Let me ask you a question. You've been at the Wall Street Journal. You're now at the New York Times. What's the difference in reader response to the kind of things you write? Well, the Wall Street Journal's audience tends to be a little bit more national. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we're writing about Bill de Blasio for folks who are living in South Dakota or California. And you get a lot of his, his fiercest critics, I've found, especially from out of state, tend to misspell his last name. That's mm -hmm. a recurring issue. But um, here in New York, I've found that uh, the audience that we have locally is extremely passionate about these issues. And so you get uh, emails, you get uh, phone calls that you wouldn't have otherwise gotten. Uh, you get great story ideas, tips. And it's also pretty satisfying because I think we are really, we have the most powerful platform. Um, and we can impact New York and New York politics and policy in a way that it's very difficult to uh, do in Washington right now. So there's a real satisfaction um, because New York politicians do care, I've found, mm -hmm. what we have to say. Voters very much 
care about what we have to say. And so uh, it's a fun time, frankly. Um, it to, sure to is. Be, and of course, with nytimes.com, you get those responses instantly. Mara Gay <laughs> yes. of the New York Times Editorial Board, thank you for joining us. And when we return, the New York Times' is Grace Ashford, reporter and researcher on the investigative team responsible for the ongoing series, Unsheltered. Welcome back to The New York Times. Close up, Times staff has been opening our eyes to the housing crisis, whether it's for the homeless, the working poor, or the middle class, and some of the reasons for the shortage. Kim Barker led the investigative team with Jessica Silver Greenberg, Grace Ashford, among others. Grace, uh, you were on that team. What is it tenants should know most about holding on to their apartments when there are obviously people out there, landlords, others who want to take them from them? I, I mean, I think the most important thing for people to know is how to order the rent history to find out whether or not they are rent stabilized. Right now, um, rent stabilized um, housing makes up the largest stock of affordable housing. There's almost a million um, rent stabilized units in the city. And a lot of times, People don't, you know, you could move in and not even know that you were. It's and if you rent stabilized, you were protected. So when you're rent stabilized, you are protected um, in two ways. One is that your rent is your rent increases are governed by um, a, a board called the Rent Guidelines Board, and they decide what percentage it goes up each year. Um, and the other thing is that you are so that protects you from, you know, skyrocketing rents. Um, you're also protected from, uh, you know, your landlord just deciding not to offer you a lease. So you're guaranteed to at least be offered a new, a new lease. Um, and, and those protections are great, but not so great if you don't know that you are. And how do you find out? So, um, I mean, it's, it's quite easy to just uh, go to uh, DHCR and request. DHCR. Is the Division of Human, um, uh, the Division of Homes and Community Renewal. Um, and with, with, within their website, you know, you can do it by email, you can request it over the phone, um, but basically just sort of see what, um, what the history of the rent was, and that will tell you what the status is. Um, but through our reporting, um, you know, we did a lot of, a lot of uh, door knocks for this story, um, you know, especially up at the Dunbar, we talked about it um, a good deal. It's this historic old complex up in Harlem. Um, and, you know, many people had no idea that they were living in rent-stabilized apartments. Um, Grace, if so many uh, apartments are protected by rent stabilization, how come, as this time series showed, so many people are getting kicked out of apartments when they shouldn't be? So the, the biggest sort of problem that we highlighted in this story is the fact that really the burden for protecting those apartments falls on the tenants. And like I was saying, if you don't know that you live in a rent stabilized apartment to begin with, you don't know your rights, um, you're not able to, you know, push for them. Um, and, you know, the regulatory system is, is disjointed, right? We've got the state uh, Division of Homes and Community Renewal. We've got city agencies um, like the Department of Buildings, um, Housing and Preservation. Um, and then we have housing courts, uh, which is a whole nother, um, you know, avenue. And landlords, big landlords, um, you know, this is their business and they're very adept at figuring out how to exploit kind of weaknesses um, in an overburdened and, you know, kind of dysfunctional system. I get an eviction notice. I don't have a lawyer. What do I do? Well, if you get an eviction notice, you're definitely going to want to go down to court <laughs> um, to try to, you know, file something, uh, get before a judge so that you can halt the eviction. Um, you know, is there anywhere to get free legal assistance? So, or? I mean, yes. The, you know, obviously there are many great um, legal services um, in the city. You know, uh, that usually you can get connected to if you speak with your kind of tenant uh, tenant organizing groups, uh, your your council member. Um, but there's also a pilot program that the city passed um, that will eventually, hopefully, um, provide free legal services to all uh, New Yorkers who are um, of low income, which is 200 percent of the federal poverty um, uh, limit. So I think it's um, close to I think it's about almost 50,000 for a family of four or in the 20,000 range for um, a single person. However, we're only um, we're only one year into that rollout. It's a five year rollout. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's only in a couple of different zip codes um, across the city. Grace, what about the landlords who say, I've got this character here who's been in the apartment for months, not paying rent. 
I just can't get him or her out. What about them? I mean, that, there are legitimate cases absolutely. where people should be evicted. Absolutely, and that, that's sort of the other really kind of interesting thing is that landlords also don't like housing court. Um, it's, you know, it's especially for small landlords. Um, a tenant who doesn't pay their rent for two, for two, you know, even months can mean financial ruin for them. And we have this kind of paradox where we have, uh, you know, really strong tenant protections, but we also, that, you know, still allow big, corporate actors to, you know, kind of manipulate them. But the tenant protections then can backfire against smaller landlords who are, you know, unable to get out, like you were saying, the tenant who, you know, is really adept at kind of working the system and staying for months without paying. So whose fault is all of this? I mean, how do we fix it? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I think, um, you know, so the right to counsel is, is a really great initiative um, and, you know, the sort of universal access, but, but it's going to be, it's going to have a lot of real challenges in the sense that the way that housing court is set up right now, um, it's probably one of, the, one of the very few courts where almost all of the landlords are represented by counsel. Um, almost none of the tenants are. And while, and that's how the court system has functioned for the last 30 years. Um, and, you know, if all of a sudden all of the tenants have counsel, it's going to slow down this already overburdened system where, you know, you have up in the Bronx, you know, e even the very physical infrastructure is um, kind of straining to meet the current demand. And so once you kind of slow it down with additional, you know, pretrial motions, um, um, you know, motion practice, um, it will, I think a lot of tenant advocates are concerned about what the actual case flow is going to look like, um, whether the resources provided are going to be able to protect um, you know, the court system itself. Sounds awful. Uh, Grace Ashford, thank you for joining us, and we'll look for additional articles in the series soon. My Times colleagues coming up on The Backstory. <music> Bigotry, hostility, anger, recriminations, just a few of the words that come to mind this week. Joining me to discuss the volatile week are my Times colleagues, contributing writer Clyde Haberman, and City Hall Bureau reporter William Newman. Willie, you and David Goodman reported on the Mayor's Fund for the City of New York, the fund now run by Shirlane uh, McLean, uh, McRae, the mayor's wife. What happened to that fund since uh, it was established under the Bloomberg administration? Well, the purpose of the fund is to raise money both from through government grants and also to a great deal from philanthropists, private indivi from individuals, and that money then goes to support city programs. Um, and it was quite successful. Uh, Bloomberg sort of restarted it. Giuliani created it. Bloomberg restarted it after 9-11 to because the city was in dire need of cash at the time. And then it grew quite a bit under Bloomberg. And then finally, when Hurricane Sandy happened, a ton of money came in for that, for the disaster. Um, de Blasio comes in and he puts his wife in charge, Shirlene McRae. And she sort of hasn't, it's her only official city job. It's her only official title. It's not paid, but she has all these other sort of jobs about mental health and such, but this is the only thing she's titled to do. She doesn't go to the board meetings. She hasn't been in the office for a year. Um, she's supposed to be one of the main fundraisers. She only does sort of occasional fundraising calls. You know, they still are, they still raise 20 million, 23 million bucks a year, but it's gone down. And this year they're set to raise quite a bit less than they have recently. So. And how does she respond to that? Um, she says it's not a contest to see who can raise the most money, but in fact, it is about raising money. Raising money. Mm -hmm. and, and would they raise more money if she were to show up? Um, well, good question. It, you know, the the question is, what is her focus? I mean, who's running it? What is, you know, how much energy and focus is she right. putting in it? And she's somebody who says that she wants to run for office now, and so it's perfectly legitimate to say, well, what has she done in this one instance? And when David and I interviewed her not long ago, one of the things she said is, look at me, look at what I'm doing. And she and the mayor have both said that she works so hard for the city. The mayor said that she should be paid. Right. Um, in this instance, she wasn't working very hard. Uh, the, the mayor, the former mayor, Rudy Giuliani, booed at the Yankee game on his birthday, Clyde. Is this, which part of this is uh, from your intro, bigotry or hostility? Um, oh, probably both. Yeah, both. <laughs> uh, 
Yes, it was uh, Memorial Day. He went to Yankee Stadium, which is supposed to be his sanctuary, and uh, he was roundly booed. Look, it, 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 a lot of us who were never big Rudy fans to start with are hardly surprised by the Rudy that's developed. He's always been, uh, uh, to be polite, confrontational. Uh, nasty is another word for it. I think an Ed Koch, in fact, had a book out called Rudy Giuliani, Nasty Man. Uh, and uh, he's now... Uh, fully in the pocket of a president who um, got only 75 percent of the vote in this city, uh, uh, not, not, you know, more than, uh, uh, I'm sorry, who, who, whose opponent got 75 right. percent, and, uh, and, uh, and she got uh, more than 80 percent in the Bronx where Yankee Stadium is. So, you know, Rudy's basically spent all, any, any goodwill he had in the immediate wake of 9-11 was blown years ago. First, when he ran for president, the country caught on to him in no time. Uh, uh, he got, what, one delegate, I think, to the uh, Republican convention that year. And now he's just a, uh, another, another not fully uh, uh, honest uh, spokesman for uh, a president who himself is a nonstop, uh, I'll be polite again, prevaricator. Read liar. Hmm. Uh, the uh, okay. What <laughs> what more could I say? Was that clear? I think I think I think uh, that you was. Want to add, Clive? No, no. And and uh, anyway, I won't sugarcoat it next time. Not right. Yeah, I want to know what you really think. Absolutely. Willie, uh, the governor seems to be now edging toward uh, congestion pricing in support of the uh, MTA nineteen billion dollar plan. Uh, do we know where the mayor is on this issue today? Um, the mayor. Uh, has I actually don't know how to answer that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, he's <laughs> sort of been uh, moving in different directions over the past year or so. I mean, the mayor's thing has been consistently the state runs the MTA. Right. The MTA is not my responsibility. He doesn't want the city putting more money into the MTA. Um, so he is perfectly happy to... To let the governor yeah. take responsibility. And what about reduced fare metro cards? Uh, he's also held out on that. Uh, Corey Johnson, the city council speaker, has been pushing that hard. It's the kind of thing that ideologically or philosophically should be right in the wheelhouse of the mayor, but he has resisted it up to this point. You know, these emails that have been revealed uh, the, of the mayor uh, basically show that he and Donald Trump are more or less the same person when it comes to their regard for uh, the news media and the press in particular. Uh, I mean, the mayor is... Well, there is a difference in degree. I, I uh, Or no. I think they're both using a, a phrase uh, that translates to fake news. Uh, and uh, the mayor comes at it from a, a leftist position of its corporate news as if, as if indeed, you know, uh, the New York Times... I mean, if he thinks that the that the corporate board of the New York Times is telling Willie Newman or me or you what to write. Uh, he's nuts, plain and simple. And, and it's the same sort of disdain. Drum up your base. They're the enemy. They're against it. I, I get bad, bad press because uh, they're, they're all against me in some ways, not because maybe I did something questionable yesterday. Is this the same kind of sanctimony if we're going to engage yes. in pop psychology yeah, here? Yeah, he, he's got, he, I think he corners the market practically on sanctimony. I mean, he really does think that he's holier than most everybody else. Although Trump seems to have taken it one step further by demanding an apology from ABC now yeah, in the right. Roseanne Barr. There's incident. a whininess on both sides. I mean, yeah. I was really struck by Trump saying oh, in response to Roseanne, yeah. sort of disgusting racist tweet and ABC's fast response, well, where's my apology? Right. The mayor was in, showed up in room nine the other day after all these emails came out, and he basically said, oh, the media doesn't treat me right, nobody's giving me the recognition. Very, very quickly, sorry. how do we explain Roseanne Barr? I mean, in this day and age, how could someone be so stupid? I think all those people are empowered by the guy who's at the top. There's I mean, that. And let's face it, I mean, this is not the only racist tweet she's come up with, calling Valerie J J uh, Jared practically uh, an ape. Uh, this is she's been doing this for years. She was and and now you know because she's representing uh, working class folks, uh, it's supposed to be okay. Of course, it's not. There's a deeply racist strain in the country, and the presence and expression of that, and mm -hmm. plenty of other people are absolutely too. don't hold back. Thanks to Clyde Haberman, William Newman for joining us, and I'll offer some additional thoughts in a moment on Coda.
When the Statue of Liberty was dedicated in 1886, immigrants weren't forgotten entirely. But the only ones mentioned during the ceremony were, quote, the illustrious descendants of the French nobility who fought for us during the American Revolution. Not until two decades later would the statue be defined as the mother of exiles. That finally occurred when the welcoming words by Emma Lazarus were affixed to the pedestal. In a timely new book, Journeys, an American Story, Andrew Tisch and Mary Scafidis have assembled 72 personal and inspirational essays. They're reminders of how tired masses and bootstrap strivers beckoned from abroad have enriched New York and the nation. Tish, the co-chairman of the Lowe's Corporation, enlisted celebrities and acquaintances to recount the dreams that drew their own families to America. Scafidis, Lowe's head of investor relations, was born in the United States of Greek immigrant parents. She didn't speak English until she was six. Her aunt was undocumented. Among their raconteurs are Pete Gogolak, the former Giants place kicker, who was 14 when he fled Hungary, Tony Bennett, who was the first person in his family to be born in a hospital, Elaine Chow, now the U.S. Transportation Secretary. Speaking no English, she struggled to understand Halloween in her third grade class in Queens. John Zaccaro Jr.'s mother was Representative Geraldine Ferraro, the first woman nominated for vice president on a major party ticket. He recalls that his grandmother couldn't write her own name, but she understood the value of education, especially for a daughter. If you educate a boy, you educate a boy alone, she would say. If you educate a girl, you educate a family. Among the most poignant essays are by less recognizable figures. A Manhattan oncology nurse from Ukraine, she observes that cancer humbles the most powerful people. A Palestinian who left a home where he said, the daily struggles of life often bring out the worst human traits. An adopted orphan from China who said, no, I wasn't born here. No, I can't become president but I am nonetheless an American. We prefer to think of our country as a mosaic, tiles of many different colors and shapes, which are indistinguishable from afar, but quite distinctive the closer you get, the authors write. A mosaic is only as strong as its grout, they add. After all, without the grout, our shared sense of ideology, in democracy, opportunity, freedom of expression and equality, the mosaic would only be a pile of stones. For The New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.